Hey guys, I just wanted to do a little bit of a quick intro before we get into it, just to explain what's going on and give kind of a trigger warning. So we're going to be talking about a rock star, rock star, um, convicted rapist from Canada um, today, and his name is Jacob Hogarth, and he was from the band Headley. Um, and I'm just going to be kind of talking about um, the beginning of his life right now and how Headley started because honestly we all know that if you're from anywhere but Canada you don't know who Headley is um, but it was a pretty big deal to Canadians and I would I don't even know who to compare them to um, in the States but um, like a three days gray situation maybe but like more pop obviously more pop than that so um, yeah, and I'm from Ontario, Canada, and, um, which was a place where they frequently, um, came about to perform, and I'm, no, and I'm going to be telling my, um, their story and the downfall of Jacob Hogarth today, so, guys, let's get in. As the seeing queen of Oxford County myself, I found myself in a lot of sketchy places, quite quite frankly, whether that be at McDonald's at 3 a.m. Uh, in London after I've told my mom I've gone for a sleepover, walking at Black Bridge at night, which is essentially the Delphi Bridge, uh, but in a small rural town in Ontario, or at the local emo show going on on the Friday night. <laughs> um, even in my tiny town of Tilsonburg, Ontario, the emo and uh, music scene was lit. We were about to have Mariana's Trench come to our little dungeon studios, um, but I, what I presume happened is that they went viral, and after that, uh, they did not come, and they relocated to a show in London, Ontario, which will come back in the later uh, episode. So, um... So, um, Dungeon Studios was this little spot that hosted a ton of little bands, and before that, um, Tilsonburg actually had a house. We just, it was like a, it was like a basement of a house that people just, it was by AMP Metro now, and, uh, people just went to it. <laughs> like, it was a thing, and people performed, and that was life back then, so honestly, like, um... I would say there was, I was probably one of the youngest people there being like maybe 13, 14, and the oldest people being like 25. So now that I think about that, that's pretty weird and sketchy. Um, and then we actually got like Dungeon Studios, which was the studio thing, and uh, it ended up going under. It was actually um, by the Hilltop Motel, and if you know, you know. Um, but it's served, I think it's now a weed shop big surprise Canada is has legal weed and there's more weed stores than Tim Hortons anyways I digress um I remember being a young pre-emo girl watching the Canadian version of American Idol Canadian Idol and I remember on season two when I was being dazzled by Jacob Hogard honestly and he wowed me and keep in mind too that when I talk about him before um I knew everything it's because I'm telling you guys my experience with him it does not reflect who I think he is now he is disgusting I can't even listen to the half the things that he's done I have so I could relay these messages properly but um yeah so when I talk about him it's pre knowing about his behaviors um I remember being a pre young emo girl watching you know Canadian Idol and um Jacob Hogard wowed me this was right around the time when panic started being popular in their own little place and um i think they really set the like paved the way for me to love panic at the disco because jacob hogarth came out wearing um a blue leotard dancing to grounds control to major tom which was a love i love that song so much even when i was a kid i didn't even know david bowie but i knew jacob hogarth right um, it awakened a lot in me to see that man in eyeliner, full leotard, 
just very queen-like, very outrageous. He was very, unlike something I think we've seen and it was refreshing to see a man pushing the boundaries again like that because I feel like we hadn't had that since maybe David Bowie um, in Canada. I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong because people will come at me for no reason. Um, so you can imagine that this man has catered to the older women of Canada and the younger females of Canada at this point, right? Um, so everybody thought that this man was, you know, super flashy, famous, um, but really he was uh, a lackluster Canadian artist who used his fans um, for sex, his, his young fans and had the government help peddle that <laughs> um, possibility to start him. Now, obviously, <laughs> Headley was obviously very popular in um, Canada, and I listened to it. So, anyways, I'm very familiar with the scene of the, of the two, early 2000s to 2010s, obviously. Uh, for being at so many concerts myself as a teen. I don't even remember every concert that I ever went to. That's how many I went to. I went to Warp Tour. I went to, um, you know, little clubs, big giant stadiums. I went to it all. And um, my favorite band, this is so sad to say, is Panic of the Disco. And it was my favorite band since they came out, but I, when I wrote this script, they were not broken up and now they are broken up and I am so, so sad. Um, and it brings up a lot about Brennan too, because Brennan essentially was canceled and you would think that he did the things that Jacob Hogarth did. So that is why it is important for me to um, talk about this, but um, I want to examine this part of my life um, and why it was so influ influential and talk about how Jacob Hogarth's case and how all this nonsense happens uh, with my education, um, educational background and child and youth care worker. I have the unfortunate uh, understanding of how sexual abuse works, how it starts and how it still applies to people, even if they're in teenagers as well, like as in what Jacob Hogard ended up doing to his teenage fans as well. So I do have um, an educational background on these things and I just thought that it was an important part of culture. Not only did Headley impact my life, uh, but I'm educated on uh, the things that he did end up doing to his fans. Um, and I've been in these personal experiences too. I've been in places that I shouldn't have been because of my space and just pushing my limits on the danger and uh, being groomed by older men. I can, ima I can think of a time where I was maybe 14, maybe 14, I think I was 14. And some 19 year old from a different town picked me up and I lied to my mom about where I was going. So, you can imagine that um, I know maybe a quarter of what these girls went through because they actually uh, were then sexually assaulted. Um, I just put myself in very stupid situations and ended up um, in, in uh, places less than a great, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I do feel like I have a lot to bring to this conversation and I honestly feel like all of the commentators um, uh, don't know about him because it's a Canadian thing. And the only Canadian things covering it are the CBC and everyone hates the CBC and they're not gonna listen to the CBC. So I think it's important, especially with all of these um, talks about grooming, to know what to look for, um, how it can start and what this looks like. So, um, to really look at all of this, we need to start from the beginning, and here we go. Jacob William Hogard was born July 9th, 1984 in Burnaby, BC, Canada, a small town just outside of Abbotsford. He was born to Nigel and Elaine, and I'm not quite sure what their last names are or 
who they are. Um, they've kind of not supported Jacob in public. I've, I've never seen it. I could be wrong. And then after all of these allegations, I'm, I don't know if they went to court, but they definitely did something to ensure um, that their privacy stays intact. So I'm just going to refer them to as Nigel and Elaine. Um, but yeah, red flag number one, because um, if your son goes, is from like a, like a town, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if you have a son that's like famous in Canada, you would be like, every person I know that has a famous son is like bursting. They love him. They brag about them all the time. Um, so I will not be saying their name. Uh, Jacob attended school in BC and by the time he was five, he had been taught piano by his aunt. And Jacob self admittedly in interviews admits that he was a class clown and a dumbass kid. He brags about it uh, being kicked out of class all the time where he ultimately got kicked out and expelled um, from his grade 11 high school uh, for lighting his desk on fire. But before that, he made his band called Headley and um, yeah, that's when he started his band. He, by the time he was 12, he had taught himself how to play guitar um, and then obviously formed the band Headley. Um, Jacob said he was influenced by the band, the Matthew Good band, or just Matthew Good, I'm not sure. <laughs> I know I'm gonna get ripped to shreds on that. Um, at 13, and ever since then he loved the genre of rock. However, he spent some, t uh, yeah, however, he spent, uh, took some time away from his rock and roll career and he also became a carpenter after high school and he took time away from that to audition for Canadian Idol. Um, he was going to make a name for himself, whether it was, um, Jacob Hogard, like, you know, star or, um, Jacob Hogard, the, <laughs> the carpenter, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, but that is what he's doing now is he is a carpenter. So just so you guys know, um, he felt that if his, the rock star thing didn't work out cause it didn't. And he knows he maybe had a little premonition. Um, he also met his first wife in high school and then they later divorced after the second album um which in no interviews does it make it seem like he was even married he very much made it seem like he was single um even after the breakup i think that's when we found out about her i could be wrong though we don't know if it's her trying to stay out of the spotlight or him asking her to we really don't know um so he when he um, auditioned for Canadian Idol. He has told three different stories, which is so funny to me because he, like, he just lies all the time. So he says that one of his stories is that his mom signed him up and everything made him go, which I don't know how that could happen, but maybe it could. Um, he told uh, people it was a dare that he went on his own. Um, but the ones that I've seen, it was his mom signing him up. That's really the only ones that I've seen, but I've been looking at interviews from the beginning recently. So maybe that's the only reason why, but I have seen him say the other story. So um, with that uh, being said, Jacob comes from a large Italian family and he always did talk his mom up in interviews, like that they were really close and that she was always very supportive of his dreams of becoming a rock star. Um, so yeah, now we're going to get into Canadian Idol. Jacob auditioned for Canadian Idol, and I actually remember it like it was yesterday, um, because I think that he might have been one of the first like emo boys to set stage in front of all of us. Um, he had a lip ring, and he didn't have his um, tattoos yet, but he definitely had like a cut up shirt plaid shirt I'm pretty sure maybe not it's a Canadian thing um and I think that um Jacob Hogart at the time was a poster boy my loves panic of the disco were not formed yet formed yet so I literally remember this um all of this as a very popular show in Canadian history 
and it was very interesting for us to finally see what Canadians had in store after obviously watching American Idol, which is something that people don't know is that Canada is very Americanized. Like we watch all of your stuff. We have American flags hanging from every place that a Canadian hang is flag is hanging from basically. Um, so yeah, uh, we, you, whatever your news is, it's our news for some reason. Um, he, uh, he auditioned for Canadian Idol with the song Forever in Blue Jeans by Neil Diamond, uh, which probably, like I said, caught the attention of many women, um, of all ages because of the Neil Diamond coverage and, you know, him being a cute young boy. Um, he was an instant, uh, hit and that he was the blueprint of, you know, the emo boy and Can I would say the Canadian emo boy, that's for sure. Um, he did really good on Canadian Idol, but he almost didn't pass his first audition and the judges actually sent him through um, after arguing about it. Um, and he really, I do feel like he broke ground uh, in Canadian history with um, the things he was doing, the things he was covering, the things he was wearing. He was just very likable. He was very outgoing, joked around like a bit of an ass, but not too much that you hated him. Um, he was very, very, very en enamoring, I would say. Um, but I remember him, um, I remember this like it was yesterday. He was in the top three and he has to be excused. He has to be excused because he basically said that he admitted to using the platform to get to wherever he needed to get and that he wanted to be back with his band and that we needed to vote him out. So we did. Canada voted him out. And uh, which is why my jaw dropped to the floor when I heard Canadian's true crime coverage of this. I had never heard that the people of Headley weren't the original Oh geez. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that he dumped his OG band and got professional music artists because they were, the other ones weren't on his level, right? Okay. <laughs> Which is funny because Jacob, I'm not sure you were at the level you thought you were, but all right. Cause I listened to the first album. It's a bit rough. Uh, it's good. Well, it was good, but it's a bit rough. Um, and you could see kind of his little bits of his character coming through already. Um, like I said, he broke a lot of barriers, co continuing to cover a variety of songs on Canadian Idol. And um, at the time, he covered people like David Bowie, Neil Diamond, Billy Joel, Paul Anka, Lifehouse, and Gordon Lightfoot. Um, he was really well liked by the audience and pushing barriers. Um, at the detest of uh, producers, but ultimately got his way and he was able to perform his eccentric por um, performances. And then um, once he left, I think it left all of us worried because we thought we'd never see him again. But a few months later, um, Headley dropped their first single, On My Own. The tip of the tongue, the teeth, the tit. <laughs> Am I right? People are crazy that they do this. Like, this is hard. I. People think it's easy. It's not. Okay. Not if you want to have quality content. You know what I'm saying? The first album was self-titled called Headley, and it came out in 2005. The tour was with Simple Plan, and they mostly t toured halls, and they were the first people that uh, they toured with. So Simple Plan was actually headlining, and Headley was their openers, and they played in like probably little community centers or halls all across Canada and like in towns or cities. Um, and their first singles from this album were On My Own, Trip, Gunnin', and 321. The next album was Famous Last Words, and it came out in 2007, and they toured with Yellow Card headlining. The Their tour, they randomly toured with John Bon Jovi, so that was like their first time opening in a big arena, um, but John Bon Jovi's Canadian do, um, dates opened with Headley for some reason, maybe because he was inspired by him or something, I don't know, but that's just so random to me. Um, 
The singles from this album were was For the Nights I Can't Remember, She's So Sorry, and Old School. The next album was The Show Must Go, and it came out in 2009. And Headley was actually headlining the tours this time, and they traveled with the Johnstones, Lights, and These Kids Wear Crowns, and they were in arenas all across Canada. So they went from, you know, their their halls to all the way to Canadian arenas. Keep in mind, just Canadian arenas, though. They barely went over to the States. Um, and if they did, I think it was more for, like, festivals. Um, the singles for this uh, were Don't Talk to Strangers, um, Cha Ching, and Perfect. Um, the next album was Storms, and it came out in 2011. And the tour was obviously had uh, Headley headlining with Classified, K Carl Wolf, and these were in arenas all across Canada. And the singles for this were Kiss You Inside Out, Invincible, and One Life. Wildlife came out in 2013, and Headley was uh, the headline tour again with Danny Fernandez and Alyssa Reed as openers, and they played in, once again, arenas all across Canada and were very popular, and the singles for this album were Anything, Crazy For You, Heaven In The Headlights, and Pocket Full Of Dreams, and the next album was Hello, and it came out in 2015. And they tour toured with Carly Rae Jepsen and a few other local bands, um, on arenas all across Canada again. Um, very, very popular in Canada. I very much focus on the Canadian part of it because every time they would release their album in the States, it didn't really do well, but their success in Canada was wild. So I just want to like emphasize how popular they were because I know it's kind of hard to understand. Like in Canada, we have something called CanCon, so 40% of our radio has to be Canadian artists. Um, that's how we know all of these random artists, like Prozac, you guys, because no one else knows who Prozac is. And I love Prozac, so I'm glad that... I didn't even know they were Canadian, actually. Um, I assumed by their accents that they were, like, French or something, which is Canadian. So, <laughs> her second language is, is French. Um... So by the time their final album had, um, you know, started be started to begin and was on its way out, um, the band had accomplished a lot in Canada from winning major Canadian awards at the um, Juno Awards, which is like the Grammys for Canada. It really is too much music awards. And he actually hosted the Junos. Um, and the Junos had like lots of star of people like The Weeknd, Justin Bieber, Shawn Mendes, um, lots of worldwide recognized pop stars. And then there's Headley. So, <laughs> um, and, um, what hopefully would be their last album was actually ironically called Cageless and it came out in 2017 and the tour was with Neon Dreams and Sean Hook and, these people went from playing in arenas all across Canada to community centers in random parts of Ontario. So um, I wanted to get into the facts about the album before I expanded on the next part. Posted because for some reason it's not posting with my last audio and video. So here, here goes nothing. So um that's all I'm going to talk about this episode. Um, and then next episode, we're going to talk about how Jacob Hogard went from being one of um, Canada's biggest rock stars to a literal convicted rapist. And we're going to go over the trial. We're going to go over the accusations. We're going to go over court. And then I think I'm going to do a third part. Um, eventually, if you guys are very interested in it, I don't want to put in too much effort if nobody's going to watch this. But I can go deeper into like, well, I am going to include some evidence um, that I found all over the internet um, last in my next video. But I can talk about in my third video if you guys want one, like maybe about the lyrics, um, how sketchy the lyrics are. And it probably wouldn't be as sketchy if he was not the one who wrote them. But for the most part, he is the one that wrote his lyrics. And it's like, is this an admission of guilt or is this emotional you know like I swear it was just a tactic for emotional manipulation um but like some of these things are all in the songs you guys and um I just kind of wanted to make this my first political not political but my first commentary 
on a situation because I genuinely, I was shocked at, um, the lack of coverage and I obviously know that these uh women I mean no foul by this but they went to CBC and nobody listens to CBC anymore and I honestly feel like until Canadian True Crime covered it um I didn't even really know the details and I feel like the details need to be shared especially within this like um this culture of gr of talking about grooming and stuff and um, like I said, I'm a trained child and youth counselor and I know the signs of grooming and I just want to talk about it when I see it. Um, because this is one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Um, Jacob fully admits that he did this. Um, he just says that there was consent when he was doing it. So that's another thing. Um, I've obviously lost my faith in the left, but seeing them, um, like seeing conservatives still go hard for Jacob Hogarth is really hard to see. Um, because here's the thing is that like what Candace and Owens and people are just not getting is that you can consent to sex and, and still be consenting to have sex, but not be consenting to be choked within sex, punched within sex, anally raped with sex. Um, these are the things that these women had to go through and had a whole bunch of people telling them that they were wrong. I have a broken fan. And it just honestly, it breaks my heart for them because I just don't think enough people are paying attention. And, you know, there's so many times where I personally, people have personally reached out to me and said like, yeah, I know somebody who hung out with Jacob Hogard, his parents had their um their parents had his number and all these things so that's just a little taste of what we're going to talk about next time i'm going to leave you guys with a clip and make sure you like and subscribe because there's more of this coming i've been in such a tizzy the last few weeks with my scam which i'm going to make a video about <laughs> oh gosh um so yeah like and subscribe and here is a uh, here is a video and just so you guys know it's extremely triggering so if you don't want to watch a triggering video don't look don't watch this um it's from one of our uh local news stations so it was about the time where jacob was caught um uh following the me too movement so yeah hope you ha guys have a great day and i'll see you next time need it uh, I like I was being a good girl and like petting my head and and at one point he was like choking me Concealing her identity for fear of fan backlash the 24 year old says Hogarth spat on her Slapped her and made her do something. She didn't want to do help me down and force me to a anal sex with him She says Hogarth didn't wear a condom and didn't stop assaulting her even as she bled from her vagina and anus in a journal entry, the CBC reports she writes about not being able to sit for two days. Although she never filed a police report, she says she did see a doctor a few days later. In this apparent medical record, it shows that she was tested for STIs and that she had mentioned being assaulted. It was the worst day of my life, and I'll never forget that day. The woman says she first came into contact with Hogart at a Wee Day concert in Ottawa two years ago, where she was volunteering. Hogart communicated with her at the event through Snapchat. But she says the two didn't meet face to face until two weeks later at the Thompson Hotel in Toronto, where she says a hotel employee let Hogarth know when his, quote, regular room was ready. The woman says, quote, of course, I expected sex. I'm not naive, but he completely crossed the line. In a statement, Hogarth's lawyer says the singer met the woman through Tinder. This is Hogarth's 2016 profile picture on the dating app. According to Hogarth, they had consensual sex, quote, Jacob is very sorry that she is upset, but that does not change the fact that they made a mutual plan to get together to have sex, and they did just that. At no time did Jacob act badly or do anything without her consent.